And I want to talk uh, briefly about the final item on our checklist, which was how to understand and account for uh, changes to the process that you're trying to control. And, and this is just of absolute central relevance. I mean, you never know what the, the real process is. You only ever have a model. Maybe that model's not even very good. How on earth are we going to design a uh, controller to make this thing do what we want, given we don't really know what it is. And uh, it's sort of one of the, one of the miracles of feedback that um, you can make this work. So despite the fact that you maybe only have a very crude understanding of the true input-output behavior of your process, still, through introducing feedback, it's possible to um, get very predictable behavior from some desired references to uh, the outputs that you're interested in. And um, we're just going to try to understand this and introduce a few tools for quantifying this uh, now. Um, so kind of the, the key point here is, I mean, you never know P. Uh, you never know the process. You have some model which you may have differing uh, degrees of faith in, or you may have faith in it to predict, say, behavior on short time scales, but not so good on long or vice versa. Um, how can we make our design um, do our, or do our, do our design in such a way to take account for this uncertainty and try to get things to behave predictably um, despite this uncertainty? So we're going to start just by investigating the complementary sensitivity function. So just to remind you, um, this was a particular closed loop transfer function given by PC over 1 plus PC. And why are we studying uh, this particular transfer function now? Well, we're, we're looking at the sort of, if you like, the input output closed loop behavior of our system. And, and I know we said you actually need to go and design a precompensator as well, and so on. So this obviously won't translate over exactly to. Um, the 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 full uh, two degree of freedom setup, but it will help us build some intuition. So we have this transfer function, which is roughly reflecting how our desired outputs depend on our desired inputs. And now let's just invest, investigate how robust this is to um, changes or uncertainty in the process. So how could we go about thinking, uh, or how could we go start thinking about this? Well, um, let's just draw a picture of the complex plane. I'm going to call it the P plane. Um, and the transfer function P for every value of S is just giving you different points in the, the, the P plane. And these are just different complex numbers. So this complex number here, this might correspond to P of J times 2. So the frequency response at frequency 2. It'll just be some complex number. What happens if we now perturb this? So this is the value of p of j over 2 in our model. We know our model's not exact. What happens if we perturb it? How will that affect t? Um, and because everything is just complex numbers here, we can uh, start to evaluate this just with uh, derivatives with respect to complex variables. So if we take the derivative of t with respect to p, treating them both as complex variables, we could get some idea for how t is going to change with respect to perturbations in uh, p. And what that means is with, for whatever value of s we happen to be evaluating p at, what happens if we push p around? How is that going to affect t? at the same value of s. So what is d by dt? Uh, dt by dp. So we need to differentiate with respect to p. And everything's complex numbers, so all the normal differentiating rules work. Um, and what do we get? We get uh, c over 1 plus pc plus and then minus c over 1 plus pc squared. So first differentiate the top holding the bottom constant, then differentiate the bottom holding the top constant. So there must be a PC in here. And then if I multiply this out, well, if I increase the power 
of the denominator here. In the numerator, I'll get 1 plus pc squared, but then I'm minusing pc squared. So this whole thing is just going to be c over 1 plus pc squared, which is actually equal to the sensitivity function multiplied by the complementary sensitivity function, all divided by p. And this is easy enough to just check for yourself. So we know what t is, and just as a reminder, this the sensitivity function was 1 over 1 plus pc. So we're just rewriting this in terms of these objects. And what this actually implies is that if we didn't differentiate t with respect to p, but if we actually differentiated log t with respect to log p, then this would be equal to the sensitivity function. And if you like, this is just a way of re-weighting the changes. So rather than considering a deviation in p, we're considering a deviation in log p instead. And the nice thing about logs is, I mean, even very big numbers become quite small when you put them through logs. So this sort of rescaling here allows you to capture, it's describing bigger uh, perturbations, if you like. And so what does this, at the end of this, what does this uh, tell us? Well, if we look at deviations in our complementary sensitivity function, which was our surrogate for um, good input-output performance in closed loop, and we perturb the plant, perhaps by quite a bit, uh, given that we're weighting everything by logs. Well, this is just equal to the sensitivity function. And so, for values of s, where the sensitivity function is small, we're very invariant to even quite large changes in um, the plant. And this was one of the sort of big realizations back in the day, sort of unlocking the power of feedback. I mean, if you like, you can even have quite uncertain, you can deal, handle quite large um, uh, uncertainty in your process, as long as you can keep the sensitivity function small, which, if you remember, that corresponded to using high gain feedback, um, then you can get quite predictable and reliable responses. And this was one of the big breakthroughs in uh, the development of the operational amplifier, this ability to use high gain feedback. Um, and rather than, I mean, people were very afraid to use high gain feedback and anticipating feeding back very large signals into the loop. This sounds very dangerous, but actually it's central to um, getting predictable behavior, um, even in the face of quite large uncertainty in the process. So if you like, this is our sort of first. Uh, result developing our understanding for making ourselves robust to changes in the process. Wherever we can make the sensitivity function small, we should get fairly predictable behavior, even with when there's fairly significant um, deviations in the process. And if you think back to the picture that we drew um, when we were looking at the effect of these disturbances, D, we had our picture of um, with our Nyquist diagrams and those balls of constant sensitivity function. Well, actually, this completely fits. Um, as long as we're in an area where the sensitivity function is uh, very small, which corresponded to being very, very far away from the minus one point, well, in fact, we can move our process around by huge distances and the sensitivity function will still be small and we'll still get the same disturbance um, rejection properties. Um, so um, regions where the sensitivity function is small, um, which corresponds to regions where you're using high gain feedback, uh, you can handle really quite wild variations in the, the process P. Um, so that's on the one hand, but what about perturbations in this sort of critical region? Um, we've also seen on these Nyquist plots that um, things eventually, as is typically at higher frequencies, the response of your plant gets, um, well, it, all of these transfer functions are going into the origin, and now we've got to start worrying about um, encirclements with a minus one point and stability properties. So let's try and get a sort of a a handle on that perhaps. So um, stability uh, 
how could we go about uh, understanding this? And I'm just going to introduce you to, it's a kind of a classical robust control technique. And if you're interested in this, I encourage you to take uh, more advanced um, control courses where no doubt this will be discussed in more detail. So we'll, let's just draw another picture of the complex plane and we're putting on our Nyquist plot like we have been a lot. Um, so this is just L of j omega, our return ratio or p times c evaluated at a bunch of different values of frequency. And yeah, it's probably not going to look like this, but let's just say that's what it looks like. So this is equal to um, our controller transfer function evaluated at this particular frequency multiplied by our process transfer function at that particular frequency. But we said we, we never know what the process is. So rather than claiming to know what the process is, um, let's change it. Um, and so rather than having p, let's keep. So this is what we're expecting our process to be. But now let's add on some uncertainty. So this is delta. This is just another transfer function. Um, we say we don't know what it is, but maybe it's got size less than um, a half or something. So we don't know what delta of j omega is, um, but we know within some accuracy at this particular frequency. They say it's within a half at this particular frequency. How is this going to affect our Nyquist plot. Well, if we just um, just assume that this controller is equal to 1 for a second, then we have some complex number here and now multiplied by something that's 1 plus um, a, a something that lies within a circle. Um, and so what do you have? Well, at any particular frequency I just have to draw on I'm saying I can lie anywhere, and the radius of this circle is the size of p multiplied by, in this case, a half. So I'm saying I don't know p of j omega anymore, but I have some like uncertainty ball, which I think it lies in. And so now rather than drawing the Nyquist diagram for this, let's just draw it for the, the balls that we get and try and apply the Nyquist criterion based on uh, this instead. And this is sort of the, the idea behind this method. Um, you, you're trying to envisage having this sort of like uncertainty ball put on top of your Nyquist plot um, and seeing how big a perturbation that you can handle um, until you go unstable. And so by measuring the size of this ball, it sort of tells you how far you are to, how far you are from instability. Um, or equivalently, how much your process can change um, without losing stability. And then once you've got your sort of head around that, you can say, OK, well, I know stability is not enough. I also know I can't go inside my sensitivity um, circle. And I know for frequencies above some number, I need my complementary sensitivity function to be small to deal with noise. So I need my uncertain circle to now lie in that region. Um, and so you, you can sort of start to build up this very sophisticated design problem where you're introducing some notion of model uncertainty and then trying to meet all of the types of design requirements that we were uh, talking about before, but with respect to this uncertain class of models instead. And that's really what um, this uh, technique is all about. We'll just pursue this a little bit further because we can connect it to the complementary sensitivity function. So let's just um, uh, draw what's going on in our feedback loop. So we've got C, but now in place of, and we still have P, so we have this, but now we've got this 1 plus delta, and I'm going to split it up in a particular way. So we can redraw 1 plus delta as a block diagram just like this. So this is 1 plus delta. And then we have feedback. We've got negative feedback, actually. So let's just put a minus sign in here. 
And let's call this signal u and this signal v. So what is so u is the input to our delta block and v is the output to our delta block. So our this transfer function that we don't know, the only thing we know is that it's contained within some uh, size. Um, and so what is u? Well, u is equal to v plus u all multiplied by minus pc. And if I rearrange this, what do I get? I get that um, u is equal to pc over 1 plus pc with a minus sign, v. So what does that mean? Well, it means that this block diagram is equivalent to delta in negative feedback with the complementary sensitivity function. So now, in order to understand what uh, values of delta I can take on, I need to look at stability of this uh, simple feedback interconnection. And so how could I be sure um, that such a feedback interconnection was stable? Well, I could apply the Nyquist criterion to this. Delta is some uncertain thing that lies within a circle. And so as long as... So let's say delta, the size is less than a half. Well, as long as the size of t is less than or equal to 2, then this implies that the size of delta times t will be less than 1. And so no matter what, so if we can design a control system such that the complementary sensitivity function is always less than 2, then we could be sure that we could handle all uncertainties of this size because the product delta, delta multiplied by t is less than 1. So if we drew the Nyquist diagram of this, it would lie inside the unit circle, and therefore you could never encircle minus 1 and introduce instability uh, by the Nyquist stability criterion. So um, here you have a, like a slightly more principled way to um, translate the size of the ball into requirements on the complementary sensitivity function. And as I said before, this is just an example of robust control system design. So how you can explicitly start to account for quantifiable measures of uncertainty in your process um, in the design and turn things into more design requirements in, uh, in, in the same set of closed loop transfer functions that we've been looking at already. So that's about everything I wanted to say about uh, process changes, but um, hopefully you can get the flavor that uh, feedback really is a powerful tool for fighting even quite large um, process uncertainty.